since the 2nd of November 2000, there has always been someone above your head in space orbiting the Earth. That's when the first crew docked to the International Space Station, and it's been continuously inhabited ever since. During the last quarter century, the station has grown from two connected pieces to the size of a football pitch, but that also means many of the parts on board are a quarter of a century old, and in some cases, even older. And the ISS is showing its age, with failing parts, oxygen leaks, and the station even spinning out of control a few years ago. With the ISS set to be deorbited in 2030, can it even make it that long? And what's being done to keep the station and its crew safe until that point? The year 2000 might have been when humans began permanent residence on station, but the ISS itself goes back further than 25 years, more like 40 years. In 1984, then President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, proposed the US building a space station known as Space Station Freedom. Tonight, I am directing NASA to develop a permanently manned space station and to do it within a decade. And early shuttle missions tested out techniques to construct the station in orbit. Then came delays and budget cuts. A shocker, I know. Europe and Japan were working on modules for the station, while Russia was simultaneously working on their own station, Mir 2. In the mid-90s, all of these countries decided to throw out the recipe book, mix everything into one pot, and utilise the parts and modules already built, but for this new international space station project. About 10% of the modules on the current day station date back to the Freedom Station, and parts are showing their age. The most significant current issue relates to one of the first segments ever docked, Zvezda. Literally translating to star in Russian, it launched on a proton emblazoned with the Pizza Hut logo, long story don't ask, and arrived in orbit in July of 2000. It has living quarters, life support systems, power distribution, propulsion systems, has a system that allows remote commands to be sent from controllers on the ground, and serves as the main docking port for Russian vehicles like Progress resupply vehicles and crewed Soyuz spacecraft. And now it has an oxygen and pressure leak. First noticed in 2019, the leak is in a tunnel between the living quarters and the docking segment. It started off as concerning, but it was manageable. Until this year. In February, the leak rate jumped to 1 kilogram per day, and then increased to nearly 1.8 kilos per day in April. For reference, the ISS is continuously pressurised to approximately 1.013 bar, the standard atmospheric pressure at sea level on Earth. Russian officials say they're not terribly worried about it. But NASA disagrees. It's now gotten to the point where whenever Russians are working in the tunnel area, astronauts on the American side of the station will close the hatch between them and the entire Russian segment. And using a special risk matrix, it's a 5x5. Five five. Not like 5x5 five five if you can hear us in chat. 5x5 five five means the likelihood of a problem and the potential consequences, both of which are at the maximum. If it gets too bad, they'll have to seal off the leaking area permanently, which means one less docking port that the station can use. The biggest problem, according to a report from the NASA Office of the Inspector General, is that neither side can agree on the cause of the leak or what each defines as too bad. Speaking of old parts, it's not just the modules showing their age, it's other items inside the station. In 2024, a part that converts cruise number ones into drinkable water broke earlier than expected, meaning there was no replacement part on station. For a while, the excess waste, shall we say, had to be stored in tanks and bags, and they were running out of storage space. Fast. Crews quickly decided to take the replacement part, which wasn't scheduled to launch until near the end of the year, and place it on board Boeing's Starliner crew flight test, which was the next US spacecraft heading to the station. Which put us in a position where we'd have to store an awful lot of urine. Obviously adding two more crew members to that further constrains the uh, storage capability we have on board. As a result of trading storage space, they had to take out astronauts Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams suitcases with many of their clothes. It's, it's funny, you're used to all these technical terms, suitcases, just like we would take on a vacation. Um, we do have a lot of generic contingency clothes on board, so not an issue. The crew's just going to use that instead of the specific items they're going to fly up. Given they're still up there as of publication, they were eventually shipped more clothes, but that's just one example of the constant need to have backup parts on station as it continues to age. 
If something breaks outside the station, then you'll need a spacewalk or extravehicular activity to go outside and fix it. Although right now, that presents another problem. Since June, there has only been one US spacewalk, and even that one didn't go as planned. As NASA's Mike Barrett and Tracy Dyson were all suited up, they opened the hatch and noticed a problem. There was a water leak in the cooling unit inside Tracy's spacesuit. This meant the spacewalk, which typically lasts around 6 to 8 hours, ended after just 31 minutes. A spacewalk which was scheduled to fix an electronics box on a communications antenna that had developed a fault. Spacewalkers Tracy Dyson and Matt Dominic were preparing for US EVA 90, Spacewalk 90 today. Uh, but today's spacewalk will not be proceeding as planned. The crew has begun taking off their suits, as you can see. These spacesuit parts have had their fair share of problems. In 2022, spacewalks were stopped after ESA's Matthias Maurer had a layer of water pool in his visor. And, as you may remember, the most severe close call happened back in 2014, when ESA's Luca Palmitano nearly drowned inside his spacesuit. It's hard to tell, but it feels like a lot of water. Oh, I see, uh... I see it now, wiggling. Can you see? It's over here, right? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. but uh, I have um, I have that, and then there is uh, about the same amount of when I took the helmet down last time, Chris. Really? Yeah, I can feel it in the back of my head. A build-up led to a blockage in part of the cooling loop, meaning that liquid used to keep things cool in the suit ended up in the ventilation loop, flooding his helmet. At one point, the water even got into his eyes, ears, and nose, making it difficult to get back inside the station and forcing him to only breathe using his mouth. Yeah, it's a lot of water. His um, head is saturated. It's in his eyes as well as in his uh, nose and mouth. It was really hard to see. I, and I couldn't hear anything. It was really hard to communicate. Uh, I just I went back using just uh, um, uh, just memory, basically going back to the airlock until until I found it. I experienced uh, what it's like to be a goldfish in a fishbowl from the point of view of the of the goldfish. Thankfully, he survived. But this shows the trend of concerns over spacesuits, which would be needed for critical repairs outside. Even the Russian Orlan suit, which is of a different design from the American extravehicular mobility unit, had their own parts malfunction just two years ago, which forced them to put a temporary hold on spacewalks. So you have to go back. Alec, drop everything and go back. For now, the US side is able to send up occasional spacesuit replacement parts on resupply vehicles launched to the station, but these suits are showing their age, and while the US suits haven't been used for a spacewalk since June, the Orland suits were used just this month. One of the more common reasons for an outdoors part to need a spacewalk repair is something called MMOD, or Micrometeoroids and Orbital Debris. Basically, teeny tiny rocks and pieces of space junk travelling roughly 10 times faster than a bullet. In late 2022, a a Soyuz vehicle that carried crew to the ISS sprung a significant uncontrolled coolant leak, spraying what looked like snow out into the vacuum of space. Russian uh, flight controllers and the flight controllers here at Mission Control in Houston have been noticing uh, a stream of particles coming out of the uh, Soyuz MS-22 vehicle. It was eventually decided that because of the leak, it was not safe for the two cosmonauts, Sergei Prokopyev and Dmitry Patelin, and astronaut Frank Rubio, to return on the MS-22 spacecraft that brought them to the orbiting laboratory. Instead, Roscosmos launched an empty Soyuz MS-23 spacecraft to dock to the station so the crew had a safe vehicle to re-enter and land in. Roscosmos says the leak was a result of an impact from a small micrometeoroid. So our current theory is that uh, this damage was caused by small particle about one millimeter in diameter and velocity about, about seven uh, kilometers per second. There's no real way to avoid impacts from those micrometeoroids, but with enough notice, they can get out of the way of space junk. In November 2024, the ISS had to move its orbit and try to avoid a piece of a defunct defense satellite that broke up back in 2015. The ISS fired its thrusters for five and a half minutes as a way to provide extra distance margin. NASA says if it didn't move out of the way, the debris would have been about two miles away and one impact could cause serious damage and run the risk of depressurizing parts of the station. As we've seen with Svezda, little leaks are risky, let alone a big one. But that is why these maneuvers exist. 
With even just a few hours notice, NASA says they can get the station into a safer position without even affecting daily operations. That November burn marked the station's 39th time doing what's known as a debris avoidance maneuver. Even if it's not debris, the ISS does have to keep firing its engines because of some good old-fashioned physics. As it orbits, the effects of the Earth still apply and drag continuously means the station gets lower and lower. The station might be in space, but even at its altitude, there are still tiny traces of atmosphere knocking about and enough to make a difference. If left untouched, the ISS could burn up early. At the moment we've got a progress vehicle attached to the aft end of the service module. And in 15 seconds, we should have a reboost of the space station. Now I'm going to hold myself as still as I can here in the US lab and see if we can detect any motion of me going that way backwards as the space station gets a reboost. That's where station boosts come in. On the Russian side, Progress resupply vehicles can fire their engines to help boost the ISS back into its desired orbit. On the US side, right now it's just the Cygnus resupply vehicle. However, those only launch about every six months and right now require a SpaceX Falcon 9 to take them to orbit. So in 2024, NASA and SpaceX performed a test using a Cargo Dragon resupply vehicle to try and boost the station. After 12 and a half minutes of firing, Dragon shut down its thrusters and proved it can help raise the orbit if needed, becoming a backup reboost option. Sometimes though, the orbital changes can be unplanned. In 2021, for the first time in the history of the ISS, a spacecraft emergency was declared. Russia's newest module, the Science Lab Nauka, docked to Zvezda's Earth-facing port. A few hours later, the module accidentally fired its thrusters, tilting the station and causing it to lose what flight controllers call attitude control. Basically, the space station was sent way off its planned orientation. This went on for nearly an hour as the station's normal attitude control thrusters entered a tug of war with the malfunctioning thrusters on Nauka. In total, the ISS flipped one and a half times. That might not sound like a lot, but remember, this station is the size of a football pitch. Eventually, Nauka burned through all of its fuel, Mission Control Moscow disabled its thrusters and switched its onboard computers to a docked mode rather than a flight mode. With attitude control regained, the ISS was able to flip back and reorient as needed. We knew from when the, um, the new module launched that it wasn't responding as expected to uh, ground control commands. And so we were ready um, for something off nominal to happen, um, which didn't happen right away at docking. But in the ensuing time, we did have, as you know, the loss of attitude control. And because we knew that this new module had arrived and, and maybe was having some difficulty with processing commands, we were all kind of ready. We were on alert to respond. And so we all responded, you know, as we are trained to do. Well, it's not the first time the ISS has had accidental thruster firings, it was certainly the most severe. So with all of these concerns, how can the ISS stay online for five more years? As I mentioned, they have new ways to boost the ISS and move it out of the way of large amounts of debris. They're also doing what they can to boost the ISS electrical power supply. While the station is famous for its giant solar arrays brought up by the Space Shuttle, they now have a much smaller solution to keep up with the growing power demands. Meet IROSA, the International Space Station Rollout Solar Arrays. Unlike the traditional solar panels that fold up like an accordion, these innovative panels roll up like a rug, making them compact and efficient for transport. They can be neatly stowed away in the trunk of a Cargo Dragon resupply vehicle and installed via an EVA once they arrive at the ISS. These resupply missions also deliver essentials such as food, water, spare parts and even treats for the crew. A couple little things um, we have here uh, with us to just prepare, which will be sort of fun. Ensuring the station remains fully operational and the astronauts well provisioned. Several iRoses have already been installed, contributing to the station's electrical power supply. As you can see, they're much smaller in size than the traditional solar arrays with a drastically lower surface area, meaning their mass is much lower, but the electrical generation is pretty much the same. That's 1990s versus 2010s technology for you. And with the successes of this rollout research and development, this technology has been used on other missions, such as the Double Asteroid Redirection Test, or DART, which infamously smashed itself into Dimorphos in 2022. Will more things break on the ISS? Absolutely, just like they do in your home. But can they be fixed quick enough to keep the crew on board safe, especially until 2030? What do you think? Let us know in the comments below. I've been Ryan Caton for NSF, thanks for watching, and goodbye.